Our theme for this week continues to be enter through the narrow gate, and we're going to discuss how we have in Christ a just and righteous king who is worthy of praise. I want you, before you snuggle into your hoodies and go to sleep, just listen for one second and think about what conflicts you have in your life right now. All of us could list conflicts that we have. Maybe they're with our friends, our significant others, mom, dad, whomever. What's the source of that conflict? I asked some students and I came up with common themes of communication maybe, time, money. And these things, while you can argue they're interrelated, they're not really the same thing. I'm a compulsive reader and I I read this about two years ago and it just keeps on coming up. And the greatest source of conflict in any relationship can be summarized, I think, in two words. You could argue it's sin, by the way, and of course it is, but I think more practically, maybe more usefully, because what can I do about sin? I would say the greatest source of conflict in any relationship is this. Unmet expectations. Think about the unmet expectations that you have with your friends. Teenagers desire recognition, time, if history is any teacher, all of you, well, a lot of you anyway, will get married someday. You're going to have unmet expectations with your spouse. Okay? I've had, uh, oh, maybe two dozen people come and talk to me last year for the uh, French to marriage class the Hebner's teach, which all of you should consider taking because this is really important to sort out. You have to have those expectations here, not here and not here. Married people in general fight about three things. Money, sex, and time. I just said sex, I know, but it's, it's true. Money, think about this. Where the money comes from, where the money goes, how it's budgeted, where it's spent, and how much is left at the end of the month, the expectations between husband and wife need to be here and not here or here. I think the sex part is pretty obvious. You've got to have expectations met. Time, who's picking kids up? Where are they going? How much time is spent with your spouse? Unmet expectations is a source of conflict in any relationship. I did not come up with this, by the way, okay? Um, I've heard this quote attributed to uh, Antonio Banderas, of all people. Um, But Derek Harvey is the one who uh, has an entire series written about this, okay? I think he may have stolen it from William Shakespeare, who said expectation is the root of all heartache. Kind of the same thing, right? James writes, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You have unmet expectations. I wanted to illustrate this because I teach through analogies. And I'm going to use my family, not my wife, to illustrate this to you. This is my family. We took his picture in Tennessee. Uh, there is see my wife Erica, my son Ben, Theo, and Addie. I want to focus on my kids for a second, if I could. The older two, Ben and Addie, are right here. Um, ben is nine, Addie is five, and our little guy Theo is two. Okay. And I, I love all of my children fiercely, but I want to talk about my daughter for a moment because she's one of the most trying human beings I've ever met in my life. Benjamin is my wife's son. Theo is two, and so we'll see what happens with him. But Adeline is definitely my daughter. She is the payback that my parents promised me when I was young. She's my little shop buddy. If I'm in my wood shop, if I'm under a car fixing it, she will crawl under there with me, even in winter. And so we begin a day in the life of Adeline. If you look very closely, this is my shop, you can see her, she's crawled up on my welding table. And I thought this was adorable because she stayed there for over half an hour. Unmet expectations. I noticed that she had a hammer and she was hammering something metallic and I wondered what she was doing. I said, honey, what are you doing? She's like, I'm dinking this circle. I said, dinking, that's an interesting word. And I walked over and she had a $75 circular saw blade, which has carbide teeth 
and she's very delicately taking the hammer and crushing each one of the teeth and really enjoying how the metal just turns into a powder when you smack it with the hammer. And I'm like, oh, you okay, know, stop, stop. So I got her down and I began cleaning up the mess and I said, okay, I need to occupy this child with something. And so I will set a new expectation for this child. I said, honey, go inside, okay? She's not allowed to use the stove, but she can use the microwave. And I'm thinking PBJ, right? I said, please go and make lunch. My, what my daughter heard was daddy and lunch, and she thought to herself, well, what does dad like to eat? Okay? Um, and so this is the story of how my girl caught fire. <laughs> okay? I was dealing with that, and I thought, okay, lunch, bad idea. I wasn't specific enough. I said, okay, what is, what is an innocuous thing I can task this child with? And I said, okay, go inside and do a puppet show with Theo. I got this figured out and cleaned up and saved my pellet grill from being burned to smithereens and went inside and noticed that my daughter had discovered my wife's nail polish. She had painted herself and I said, what happened? And she said, well, in the story that I did in the puppet show, there was a lion, okay? And daddy, I won, but he got me. And at this point, she can see that I'm not pleased with her, and so she starts crying these big, fat tears. And I'm thinking, okay, this is kind of cute, so I should take a picture of this, all right? And she said, Daddy, the lion got Theo, too. I didn't take a picture of that because I had to figure out how to get nail polish off of a toddler's arms. Okay, so I thought, okay, all right, go upstairs and take a bath. Now, she's taken baths on her own before, and she knows the rules. I said, where does the water stay, child? Where does the water stay? In the bathtub, Daddy. Okay, what can you touch? Only water and soap. That's it. Nothing else. I got the grill cleaned up. I got Theo cleaned up. <sighs> Ordinarily, I would not show tubby pictures of my kids in front of a thousand people, but I think this is probably pretty safe. And her response to me was, Daddy, there's no water on the floor at all. Okay, never mind the fact that um, you just killed the bathtub. Okay, after all of this, again, the most determined child in the world, let me see if I can get this thing to work here. Okay, she is American Ninja Warrior style, trying to climb, trying to climb this, and this is eight minutes in now. I skipped way ahead, okay? If you notice, her little leg muscles are quivering and shaking, and she wants to do this because her brother got to do it. And we got to keep that on the level, right? It has to be here when you have more than one small children at home. Um, and so she's trying, and she's trying. <laughs> Okay, and she's actually fighting back tears at this point, okay, and, and really just trying for it, and I told her she had to stop, and she burst into tears, and then she said a word that I think she picked up at school. It's not a word that I endorse or an expression that I or my wife use in front of our children, ever. And it is, in fact, a word that begins with the letter F. I know, I know. I, it must have been one of her friends at school, because we don't talk this way at my house. But she said it, and she said it after all of these things had transpired this day. I know. That's not fair. And I thought, fairness? Are you kidding me, child? You, you could have just destroyed, like, a thousand dollars worth of stuff and gone through all of this, and, and she's going to sit there with her bare face hanging out and tell me that, that bedtime isn't fair. Consider for a second, what do you call unfair in the context of the expectations your Lord has for you? I've heard kids say that several things are unfair. Okay, parents, teachers are unfair, people who have authority over you whomever that happens to be in whatever context, the cops, your boss, whatever it is, unfair. 
Well, I would subscribe to you that, that we have pretty seriously violated God's expectations in the relationship that we have with him. Okay? I ought to make this big enough. Um, well, first of all, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you're like, well, I didn't do that. It's like, well, no, but our ancestors did, and we inherit their sin, right? Um, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. That applies to us. I haven't done that. This is love for God to obey what he commands. That's not me, and it's not you. And so each of you has this lawyer-like sense of fairness. I used to teach grade school. Grade school kids are like little lawyers, okay? If you do one, one thing for one, you do it for all. Your own personal children are worse, and their memories are deep. Well, what if God applied your sense of fairness with other people to you? How would you fare? Pun intended. So, thankfully, we have a just king, okay? The sense of justice that our Savior Jesus has is perfect. He demands justice for our sin, and then he steps in to take our place when we could not. We have a righteous king. Christ was perfect where we could not be. Jesus demands perfection from us, and then we can't do it. He does. He lived the life that we couldn't so that we could simply live. I close with this thought. The next time that you are tempted to say that something is unfair in your life, in particular, living with the incredible blessings of being in this place, in this time, in this period of history, all right? Before you complain, take a moment to try to do this. Be thankful. Be thankful that we have a just and righteous king who thankfully does not share in our sense of fairness. Amen.